listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Hey guys, welcome to the Full Circle Music Show. This is Chris Murphy sitting beside Seth Mosley. Hello, sir. Hey, man. We thought since we're kicking off this podcast that we wanted to speak to the man himself. Multiple Dove Award winning songwriter and producer, as well as Grammy Award winning songwriter and producer. Seth Mosley has got Full Circle Music right here in Franklin, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. So without further ado, let's get right into it. The interview with Seth Mosley of Full Circle Music. I am excited that this is our inaugural recording. Yeah. And I thought maybe what we could do for our audience is to give them a little taste as to why is the Full Circle Music Show a show? Why is it a podcast? What uh, was your idea when you uh, decided to start this and what you hope the audience can get out of it? Yeah. um, I think the big thing for us was just to kind of uh, get around other industry professionals and find out kind of how they're navigating today's ever changing music industry because we know how crazy it is on our end of of doing what we do at full circle music um but we i i i do believe that there's uh strength in numbers and um absolutely you know as a music industry united going forward to make sure we're kind of all rowing in the same direction so to speak yeah it is quite a complex uh group of questions and thoughts and processes and it's ever changing all the time yeah. regardless of uh what industry or genre that you produce or you write for or uh that you are a fan of yeah uh, that it's constantly changing out there from a business perspective what are some of the uh changes that you've seen in the years that you've been uh producing and songwriting as well as being an artist sure well yeah i, I started out uh, as an artist that was my kind of uh entry into the music business i toured for about three years pretty full time we were doing anywhere from 100 to 150 shows a year and um since then i i kind of got burned out on it really quick and figured out that the part of the process i really enjoy is what we're doing now which is the creative side where we're writing and producing and uh, tracking the stuff in the studio so um that's kind of what i had transitioned into but since then, there's definitely been a lot of changes. Uh, I moved to Nashville probably officially six and a half ish years ago, and so that, even 2009, 2008, something like yeah, that. Yeah, about 2008, 2009, okay. exactly. So right as the market was kind of tanking and everything, <laughs> so I I came in at a very interesting time, and um, we hear a lot of doom and gloom, uh, you know, surrounding the music industry with sales and streaming and Spotify, Pandora, all that stuff and how that affects our income. We can proudly say that as a as full circle music that every year since we've been in business has been our best year. Wow. So and I don't think that's coincidence, you know, I I just I, I have a very positive outlook on the music industry comparatively with a lot of my other uh peers and people that I work with, I think. So quickly, as a side note, uh, for those uh, that don't know, what is Full Circle Music to you and and to the world at large? Well, Full Circle Music is a team. Um, It was kind of an effort for me to intentionally come out and say that, yes, this is a team sport. It's not just me. Mm. And it really always has been from the beginning, but even more so now. Um, right now it's a small team, but we're, we're growing and, and hopefully in the next couple of years going to be expanding into having, uh, some, some writers under our roster and some producers. And eventually, um, you know, if it makes sense and we find the right artists to be able to even do a, uh, a joint venture with a, a label and help kind of develop in that way. So, but again, the key word is the right, the right people. So we've been actually, you know, probably going on the slow side just to make sure that who is in our team is the right people. Right now it's me and, um, X O'Connor is our, is my co-producer engineer mixer. He does, you know, a good chunk of everything. And then we've got another guy named Jericho Scroggins. Yes. Jericho Scroggins. That is the name. (laughs) And, uh, he's running the ship. So it's, it's a lean, mean machine. And then we have five or six other, um, guys who kind of do editing stuff for us at any given moment as well so well for a small team you've got a lot of hardware on the wall well that's a i think that's probably a good thing then the hardware per person ratio it has been good so far so (laughs) well uh kind of building on that you said that every year that you guys have been doing what you're doing that it's been growing 
What do you attribute that to when everybody else, or, or it seems like a lot of people out there are talking about that doom and gloom that you mentioned earlier? I mean, I, I, I think it's the focus on two things. Number one is, I mean, and, and this is cliche, because especially in Nashville, our focus is the song. Yeah. Everything comes back to songwriting. Um, and that's the starting point. Production, that's not to say production isn't as important. It is. But if you, you don't have anything if you don't have a good song at the beginning. So I think that's been more of my strength. Um, a lot of people would say they're producer writers. I, I would say I'm probably more so a writer producer, if anything. And, and that's why having people like X and Jericho around are key because their strengths complement, you know, where, where I, where I lack. So, um, so I think that's been one thing is focus on the song. And the second thing is just the fact that, um, it's just our, our why behind why we do what we do is we're here to serve. You know, that's our first thing is we're in a, uh, service business. A friend of mine taught me that really early on when I moved to Nashville and that stuck with me. This really is a service business. And when you say service, do you mean servicing the song, servicing the artist, servicing the label? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, it's it's really whoever's in front of us at any given moment, how can I serve you? Whether that, that is the song or whether that's the artist. Um, the fact is, is that we are just here to enable and help facilitate artists to pursue their dreams and, and their careers. Um, so... Any any way that we can add add value to what somebody's doing, that's that's kind of our 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 mantra. We're always here to serve first. We're not coming into a room with any sense of ego or trying, you know, what can we get out of a situation? But hey, here we're here to serve and and give and give and give and give. And it seems like it's just been kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, the universe's way of giving back to us. Sure. Or just, you know, we're, we, we come in with that mentality and it, it seems to be working okay. You know? Is there a tangible example of that that you can think of off the top of your head? And if you need to leave names out, that's fine. But maybe something that uh, kind of really shows that service. Y- yeah. Um, I would say, honestly, and, and this, was, this wasn't something that I, some brand new concept that we came up with. It was really more something that I learned by seeing how, some some other peers and mentors in the business were doing it. It's just the fact of they don't quit until the artist is happy, mm. and and that's the same with us. We'll go rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds, and sometimes I actually just had had a conversation with a friend of mine about this, and we always have to remind ourselves that Michael Jackson's Thriller underwent ninety seven or so versions before the you know they settled on the final 97 so. something like 97 wow. almost i know it's almost 100 good grief but um i think i think that's kind of one very tangible thing we're not stopping until the artist the label the manager and everybody is really really pumped and signed off and proud to have their names on it i was actually talking to jericho about this a couple of days ago this this exact topic for you as a producer writer uh a person who is kind of a um, go-between, when do you um, get to the point where you say, you know, there's that saying that the customer is always right? Yeah. Is there ever a point in time where you say, well, I understand that, but my experience says that maybe we need to go down this path, and then maybe how do you lead that into that conversation if that's the case for you? Sure. No, that's that's a great question. Um, and it could very often be the case where – you know, I, I have obviously this is a very subjective business. Absolutely. And it's not a, a business of what's right and what's wrong. It's really a business of, again, um, I'm putting my preferences, opinions, and um, even quote unquote expertise aside sometimes to serve what an artist's vision is. Because there's a lot of the times that, yeah, it probably isn't the first thing that I would do. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It just means that I'm helping draw out the best version of them. Um, you kind of said, like, my expertise on what works and what doesn't work. You know, that, that, that's that been another thing that's served us really well, is I think we try to go in with a mentality of, you know, hey, there's no black and white. There's no rules. There's not a this works and this doesn't work. Granted, we do work in some pretty narrow radio-driven formats, and there are sure. things, but here's the thing. I mean, we always chase the artist's dream all the way to the moon and sometimes have to pull it back to the earth. So <laughs> um, I could, we could very easily 
um, in those situations, just like you said, point to the hardware on the wall and say, here's, you know, check the score. I've heard, I've heard <laughs> some guys say that. And I can never imagine personally us doing that. Sure. I think we're, we're literally probably the opposite of that to a fault. So, well, again, I think that that's probably why you're in demand and uh, a, a pleasure to work with because sure. there's a lot of people out there that there's a lot of producers or songwriters that people could go to. Yeah. So the fact that they're choosing you is because you bring that unique personality to it sure. that, that draws people to it. For a producer that's getting started out there, um, or a songwriter as well, maybe uh, what are um, what's a tip or two that you could point them to uh, when you talk about service sure. and, and trying to find the artist's vision if you're producing a, a project? What's something that somebody, a, a an applicable takeaway that somebody could jump into right now and well, I would say if you're trying to learn to get good at your craft of production or songwriting or anything in the music business, learn to do that, but even more so, learn to be a collaborator. I think there's a lot of really good songwriters that we know that kind of shoot themselves in the foot, that they're mo the most talented people in the world, but they'd probably be a lot more successful if they were just spent a little more energy learning how to be collaborators sure. rather than just saying, Here's the idea. Here's the vibe. Take it or leave it. You know, so I I would say focus on that, and that kind of just takes a lot of um, humility, really. Hmm. You know, so just kind of do some soul searching and say, why am I in this in the first place? Am I in this because I'm trying to scratch some ego itch that I I have or an insecurity or whatever? Sure. Um, so I would say that's first and foremost because people look for collaborators. They aren't really looking especially nowadays for um, ultimatums. Yeah. So that's, that's a really good point. And it makes me kind of think about when you were saying earlier that you were on the road pretty hardcore for several years um, and it burned you out pretty badly. Um, was there a moment in that process to where you thought, okay, I've, I've, I'm a good writer. I produce stuff. Uh, this could be a path for me more so than being the artist on the road in the tour bus. Sure. Or the tour van. Or the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we kind of ended up in the bus on the very tail end of what we were doing, and it's kind of ironic that, yeah, as soon as we got into a bus, I was already burned out on it. And sure. It's like, that's kind of what every band shoots for, is to like you know get on the road and have a bus and be flying around and doing it that way. But um, I think there was a really clear moment, and, and that was in the beautiful, glorious state of Iowa, <laughs> Every time we went through Iowa on tour, it seemed like something, the universe was just against us. Sure. Like God was saying, do not go to Iowa. <laughs> just, just drive not, around the corn. Drive around it. So the the last straw in Iowa, uh, store, probably story number three or four, after having bro been broken down there and stuck there in snowstorms and ice storms and all that other stuff, the last straw was uh, we were on tour out there, and it was, of course, snowing and sleeting and everything in, in the van we we i think we were outside of uh sioux city and we heard a giant bang and uh we we looked around like what in the world and then the van just kind of just grinds to a halt oh no we get out and it looked like somebody shot a cannonball like through the bottom of the <laughs> 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 like something literally blew up under it and wow so it was at that point that we had to call U-Haul, sit there in the cold for two and a half hours and, and wait on them to show up and got finally got to the venue. And in order to just even get home from that that weekend that we were doing, we had to rent a U-Haul and rent a rental car and drive all night. And the, the choice was, you know, do we fix the van or do we just dump it and leave it there with the trailer and say, hasta la vista, because we owed money on it. And, we're, mm. and that for me was kind of like... I felt like it was God's way of saying, hey, you know, maybe it's time to, you know, start focusing on something else. Sure. So, um, we never went back for the van or the trailer. Some, really? Somebody's, you know, still still there with it. Wow. <laughs> it was a tax write-off. So <laughs> um, that was the moment that, you know, and, and honestly, uh, sometimes life does that where it, it just makes decisions for you. And sometimes that's what we need. So, and that's what that was very clearly. Um, because I had been doing production and writing the whole time and was having some success at it. And honestly, taking care of our family through that side of things, it, it, the, the financials of touring were not 
in our favor. Sure. But on the, on the production and writing side, I had already had some things rolling with Newsboys and um, some other projects as well, too. So it was kind of a natural transition. And a lot of people say, that, you know, you kind of just got to make the leap of faith out and just switch. But honestly, for us, it wasn't a leap of faith. For us, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. It was, hey, I get to stay home with my wife. And we didn't have kids at the time, but we, we got to stay home, hang out, didn't have to go get in a van and drive all night or a bus. Sure. And actually, you know, pay our bills with it. So right. for us, it was a bit of a no-brainer, and that was definitely the situation that, you know, sparked it for us. Well, I think that's a good transition that I'd love to hear uh, from somebody that's been on many different sides of the music industry, being an artist uh, and now producer, songwriter extraordinaire, is that process. Extraordinaire. Um, I don't know about that. But. Well, okay, then I'll, I'll just say that out loud. <laughs> you, you don't have to agree with it, but I'll say it uh, for you. Um, that I think that it makes sense to talk about you may have a soul passion in the music industry or whatever industry that you're in, uh, but the fact that you had many different things going on, you didn't have all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Could you speak to that for those out there that are just saying that, you know what, I just want to be behind the boards. I just want to uh, be on a be in a bus and break down in the middle of Iowa. Like, that's my dream. That's my passion. Um, is, there, is there validity in having your eggs spread out? Or is there also validity in having all your eggs in one basket? To, when you're I, chasing that dream. I would say that I would go back to the proverb of chase two rabbits and you will catch neither. Mm. I think the moment that we made that decision to get off the road and focus on one thing was like a cannonball. It was like a, a spark for our career on the production and writing side. Cause mm. it was like, okay, well there's no longer conflict of interest. There's no longer making the decision of what do I focus my energy on? I only focus on one thing. Sure. And it's the, the full circle music side. So I'm a very big believer um, in, in being focused on one thing. I, I, I think in the financial uh, industry, we hear a lot about diversify, diversify, diversify. Sure. And that is true once you've achieved some success to protect what you have. Right. When you're in the, in the beginning stages and growing and growing and growing, it's really put your all all of your eggs in one basket and watch that basket really carefully. That's then, that's okay. that's what I'm kind of leaning towards. Yeah, that makes sense. So watch that basket carefully, and then when you get to the point where that's on autopilot or that it's it's running itself, whatever it is, then maybe you can move on to something else. But yeah, and even then, I don't know that there is ever truly an autopilot. I think you're. You know, I mean, there, there's some degree of, yeah, we can maybe take take some time off and stuff will still happen and whatnot. But I think no matter what the case is, if you're focusing on one thing, that means it's one thing that you're not focusing on. You're That's taking true. away from the other side of things. So yeah. honestly, there's always going to be a little bit of trade-off there. So right. um, I, I think, honestly... Well, there's a really good book, actually, I would recommend it to all the listeners out there. It's uh, Gary Keller's The One Thing. And uh, we recently went through it, and it was really good for me on focus. Absolutely. Um, and that applies to people in music or investing or, or anything in life, to be honest. Um, I'm, I'm very big on focus. That's great. Do you miss it? Do you miss the road? Do you miss being an artist? Not for one second. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. Every time I see a bus drive by or a van or a trailer, I'm just like, oh, thank God I'm not on it. <laughs> I kind of start sweating for the people inside it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you've got some so, sort of a response, some um, PTSD or something from being on the road. Well, long. it's, you know, it's it, I'm making it sound really bad, but honestly, I mean, there's a lot of great things. And probably the biggest thing for me was I met my wife through it. So wow. had, I, had I not done it, you know, I, I, um, I wouldn't have known her and we wouldn't be where we are today. So um, the universe definitely has its way of circling things back around. And sure. it's just part of, you know, how God used. And I think he used it honestly to, 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 to our favor on even what we're doing right now. Cause we're able to relate with artists in a different way than somebody who's never been on the road. Sure. Is. We have firsthand experience of saying, okay, I know, I know what you're going through. I know how, how hard you're working every night. I know what it is to play these songs every night and go do the radio tours because we've we've done that and we've been there. So sure. it helps us relate in a, in a different way. Other than just that experience of just being in the trenches for years and doing it and then uh, transitioning to what, what you're doing now with producing and songwriting, 
or songwriting and producing. Um, what, what kind of education did you have behind you when you started? Um, a high school diploma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and about, uh, let's see, it, it, where I grew up in Ohio, we had a thing called post-secondary education where you could take college classes in high school. And I did probably 12 credit hours of that. So that was the extent of my education. Oh, wow. Okay. And YouTube really wasn't even a, a thing now. And, th- and, and that is a big part of uh, education nowadays. You can learn to do anything you want on the internet. So sure. That really wasn't as much of a, a thing that was available. People weren't creating these tutorials and videos of how to do stuff. It was really just diving in and watching other people work and... So really from the music business standpoint, your life experiences was your classroom. Exactly. Yes. But that's not to discount. Um, I would say that's my classroom, but, but the other part of that is just watching other professionals and, and what can I learn from them? And that's part of our servant mentality is walking into a room saying, Hey, what can I learn? Not what can I teach? It's, it's, you know, a lot of people graduating from college nowadays uh, that we find because we have an internship program and we have some great interns, but we've also s- sensed a, a little bit of a mentality. Uh, and I don't know, in the, it's just been in the past few years of maybe this entitlement thing uh. where people think they're going to graduate and get hired as a producer or a songwriter, or get a giant publishing deal or whatever it is. That's really not the way it works. You have to kind of come into a room and show that, hey, I'm here to serve and I'm here to add value, and only then does do things start kind of opening up for you. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I guess I guess a diploma on the wall is great, but if it doesn't have the experience behind it, then it doesn't speak too much. Yeah, and the and the heart behind it to serve, you know. I mean, that's I think nowadays is so important. You just have to be going into a room. How can I add value? How can I add value? Not yeah. and not what can I get out of the situation? Sure. Well, what would you say to somebody who's sitting in uh, music school right now or uh, doing a production uh, licensing or w- whatever that would look like uh, that's, uh, that's in the thick of it, that's listening because they want to uh, graduate in a few months and come to Nashville and, and uh, sure. be on the Seth Mosley plan? Yeah, no, I, I mean, we, we have, me and Jericho have these discussions all the time with, with our interns of, um, of you know, kind of saying, okay, it's it's really all about why am I doing what what I'm doing? Sure, because we never want to put off the vibe that hey, don't go to college, you're not going to get anywhere with it. That's not what we're saying at all. It's more so, hey, if you're going to college, how do you use that to further and get closer to where you want to be? Absolutely. And really, it's 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 all what you make of it. It's all how what do you put into it? Who are you meeting? Who are you serving? What kind of experiences are you getting out of it? What are you learning? And, um, so I would say if you really feel strongly that, you know, you're, you're using that as something to get closer to where you're uh, going, keep, keep on and finish, finish strong, you know? That's great. Yeah. But I would also say on a more, you know, down to earth, realistic, because we're definitely realists over here, um, on a realistic note that don't think that just because you do graduate and get that diploma, that it's going to mean that you're going to get hired right away. Sure. Maybe that's one in a hundred or one in a thousand, you know, situations, but you're going to get hired because of who you are and what dynamic you add to a room. If you have a diploma, maybe that's icing on the cake, but that's definitely not what we look for Absolutely. in a company you know, or in, in, in a, uh, in a, in a student or somebody to hire. You yeah. Know, so, so just to nail it down, what are you looking for when you're reaching out to find either an intern or the next employee or uh, so for someone out there that's like, oh, okay, I, I get what Seth is saying, but uh, maybe what are a few things that I need to be working on to make sure that by the time I'm ready to strike, I'm ready to go? Well, I think not to keep saying the same thing and being a broken record, but we look for servant hearts. Yeah. You know, that's the that's the first and foremost thing. Second thing is, yeah, I mean, there's got to be some raw talent there. I mean, and and again, that's all subjective too. But sure. It, we have to at least really dig and connect on a creative level. Otherwise, it's not going to work that way. Um, and the third thing would just be work ethic and enthusiasm hmm. for it, you know, because it's not a business that really lets you have typical nine to five, you know, most weekends off. I mean, we, we try really hard at Full Circle to have a pretty normal semblance of 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 a a normal life you sure, know for sure. for me and for the guys that work with us because i think that's important for balance but 
Um, that's definitely on the beginning, maybe not the not the norm. Yeah, it's a little more the exception. So, I would say just you know you gotta you gotta know it's what you want to do and have the work ethic, have the enthusiasm to stay up all night and you know grind it out until you till you get good because it really is about that 10,000 hours and, yeah. and and putting that in so, and and if 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 even that I mean I'm I'm kind of still feeling like as we cross our 10,000 hour threshold like man I'm still learning every day and I feel like if you're not you're just getting further and further behind sure Seth, this was great, man. I, you know, in one of the opening episodes of this podcast, uh, we both sat down and talked that we wanted to really hear from other industry professionals and their their heart and their desire and their expertise. Uh, so that could be uh, something that others can grow from. But I, I'm grateful that you were willing to sit down with us today and kind of give your heart. And I know that you're going to be giving that a lot because you're going to be sitting at the microphone every time. Uh, but to hear from you and to see kind of where you've come from and where you're going. And, and I think the biggest takeaway is the fact that you said, when you walk into a room, you think, what can I, how can I serve or what can I uh, give, not what can I get, so to speak? Yeah. And I think that's huge. Yeah. And so I, I appreciate that. But is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with as we, as we step away here? I mean, I would say, you know, the other, the other big thing is, yeah, serve, but it's also, um, to kind of piggyback on what we were saying earlier, if I could kind of put any title behind it, it's no plan B. Hmm. I think the people who have a fallback plan are going to do that fallback plan. Absolutely. Um, and at some point, you know, you got you got a wife and kids, and you got to do what's responsible for them. But especially when you're on the front end, and you're if you're single or young or married or whatever, you know, just you just kind of grind it out and figure out how to um, how to make it work. You know, because sure. um, I. I think another another friend of mine who's in the industry who's been in it for a long time that was his advice in his panel to a bunch of Belmont probably 200 Belmont songwriting students he had them raise their hand and say hey who has a plan B probably 75% of the room put their hands up and he said okay get out now <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't saying that to be mean he was just saying hey that's the reality if wow. you have a plan B, you're going to do the plan B. Yeah, sure. Honestly, I didn't know growing up or in co- you know in in high school what else besides music I would do. It, it was just the only thing that I felt like I knew how to do, and right. the only thing that that drove me and gave me happiness and satisfaction. Um, obviously, as as life progresses, you kind of you kind of develop those those things, but honestly. Ha- not having a plan B is the best thing in the world for you because you're going to figure out how to make it work because you have to. That's great. Seth, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, we hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'll join us again soon on the Full Circle Music Show. The why of the music is. Check us out at fullcirclemusic.org slash podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Seth Mosley. I'm a Grammy-winning, Billboard-winning, 21 number one winning, successful producer and songwriter, and I'd love to share with you 10 free tips straight to your email inbox for successful songwriting. All you have to do is click here and get it. Thanks for watching.